Hello there, MSL here and welcome to this summary video on IFRS 15 Revenue from Contracts with Customers which specifies how and when an IFRS reporter will recognize revenue as well as requiring such entities to provide users of financial statements with more informative and relevant disclosures. So as a standard, IFRS 15 has been through quite a long history right from 2002 all the way to May 2014 when the standard was initially issued and then in 2015 the IASB decided to defer effective implementation of the standard to 1st January 2018. So the standard IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers was issued in May 2014 and it applies to annual reporting periods beginning on or after 1st January 2018. As a standard this new IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customer standard replaces or supersedes a number of standards and interpretations. The first is IAS 11 construction contract, IAS 18 revenue. These two standards are now governed by IFRS 15 and then also IFRIC 13 on customer loyalty programs, IFRIC 15 on agreements for the construction of real estate, IFRIC 18 on transfers of assets from customers, and SIC 31 on revenue and barter transactions involving advertising services. All of these have been superseded or replaced by IFRS 15. What is the objective of IFRS 15? Why was this standard issued? The objective of IFRS 15 is to establish the principles that an entity shall apply to report useful information to users of financial statements about the nature, the amount, the timing and the uncertainty of revenues and cash flows arising from a contract with the customer. Remember, this is very, very important. Let's talk about the scope of IFRS 15. What does the standard cover and what does it not cover? First thing to remember is that IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers applies to all contract with customers except for a number of exceptions. The first is leases within the scope of IFRS 16 leases. The next is financial instruments and other obligations within the scope of a number of standards. Some of these standards include IFRS 9 financial instruments, IFRS 10 consolidated financial statements, IFRS 11 joint arrangements, IAS 27 separate financial statements, and IAS 28 investment in associates and joint ventures. The next item that is out of scope will be insurance contracts which are currently governed by IFRS 4 insurance contracts but will be replaced by the new insurance standard IFRS 17 and then finally non-monetary exchanges between entities in the same line of business to facilitate sales to customers or potential customers would also be out of scope of IFRS 15. It's important to also mention that a contract with a customer may be partially within the scope of IFRS 15 and partially within the scope of another standard. So in that particular scenario, if other standards specify how to separate and or how to initially measure one or more parts of the contract, then those separation and measurement requirements are applied first. Take note, however, that the transaction price in such a case will be reduced by the amounts that are initially measured under the other standards. However, if no other standard provides guidance on how to separate or initially measure one or more parts of the contract, then in that case, IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers will be applied. Now let's come to perhaps the most important part of IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers. The core principle of IFRS 15 is really that an entity will recognize revenue to depict the transfer of promised goods or services to customers in an amount that reflects the consideration to which the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for those goods or services. So this core principle is delivered in something called a five step model framework. Step one, is to identify the contract with the customer. Step two is to identify the performance obligations in that particular contract. Step three is to determine the transaction price. Step four is to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations you identified in the contract. And finally, step five is to recognize revenue when or 
as and when the entity satisfies each performance obligation. It's important to mention here that application of this guidance will depend on the facts and circumstances present in a contract with the customer and will require some exercise of judgment. So now let's talk about the specific steps into a lot more detail. So under step one, what are we supposed to know here? So here we are saying a contract will be within the scope of IFRS 15 if all of the following conditions are met. What are these conditions? The first is that the contract has been approved by the parties to the contract. The next is that each party's rights in relation to the goods or services to be transferred can be clearly identified. And then the payment terms for the goods or services to be transferred can also be clearly identified. The next is that the contract should have commercial substance and finally it should be probable that the consideration to which the entity is entitled to in exchange for the goods or services will be collected take note however that if a contract with the customer does not meet all of these criteria the entity will continue to reassess the contract going forward to determine whether it subsequently meets the above criteria that i just mentioned from that point onwards then the entity will then apply IFRS 15 to that particular contract with the customer. IFRS 15 also has rules on approved contract modifications. So still under step one, the standard gives us rules around contract modifications. If certain conditions are met, then what rules will apply? If certain conditions are met, a contract modification will be accounted for as a separate contract with the customer. If not, then what will happen? It will be accounted for by modifying the accounting for the current contract with the customer. Now take note that the modification I just spoke about, whether it will be accounted for prospectively or retrospectively would depend on whether the remaining goods or services to be delivered after the modification are distinct from those delivered prior to the modification. So this is important to remember for cases where there are contract modifications within the course of performing that particular contract with the customer. Now let's move to step two within the five step framework. So at, in step two, we are saying that at the inception of the contracts, the entity should assess the goods or services that have been promised to the customer and identify as a performance obligation, a good or service or in some cases, bundles of goods or services that are distinct or a series of distinct goods or services that are substantially the same and that have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. Take note that a series of distinct goods or services is transferred to the customer in the same pattern if the following criteria are satisfied. The first is that each distinct good or service in the series that the entity promises to transfer consecutively to the customer would be a performance obligation that is satisfied over time. The next is that a single method of measuring progress would be used to measure the entity's progress towards complete satisfaction of the performance obligation to transfer each distinct good or service in the series to the customer. So when these criteria are met, then we can see a series of distinct goods or services will be transferred to the customer in the same pattern. However, a good or service is distinct if both of the following criteria are met. The first is that the customer can benefit from the good or services on its own or in conjunction with other readily available resources. And then the entity's promise to transfer the good or service to the customer is separately identifiable from other promises in the contract. So now let's talk about the third step, which is to determine the transaction price. Here, take note that IFRS 15 determines the transaction price as the amount the entity expects to be entitled to in exchange for the transfer of goods and services. It's important to mention that when making this determination, an entity is required to sometimes consider past customary business practices. Now, still on transaction price, there could be cases where we have elements of variable consideration. So where an entity contains or where a contract contains elements of variable consideration, the entity will estimate the amount of variable consideration 
to which it will be entitled under the contract. So here we are saying variable consideration can arise, for example, as a result of discounts, rebates, refunds, credits, price concessions, incentives, performance bonuses, penalties, or other similar items. Take note that variable consideration is also present if an entity's rights to consideration is con is contingent on the occurrence of a future event. Also, the standard deals with uncertainty that relates to variable consideration by limiting the amount of variable consideration that can be recognized. The specific rule that IFRS 15 provides is that variable consideration is only included in the transaction price if and to the extent that it is highly probable that its, its inclusion will not result in a significant revenue reversal in the future when the uncertainty has been subsequently resolved. Finally, a different, more restrictive approach is applied in respect of sales or usage-based royalty revenue ar arising from licenses of intellectual property. Here I'm saying that such revenue is recognized only when the underlying sales or usage occurs. Let's move then to step four in the revenue recognition process. Remember that step four was when we said you allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations in the contract. So here, the key thing to take away is that where a contract has multiple performance obligations, an entity will allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations in the contract by reference to their relative standalone prices. However, if a standalone selling price is not directly observable, the entity will need to estimate it. IFRS 15 suggests various methods that might be used to make the estimation, including something called an adjusted market assessment approach, an expected cost plus a margin approach, a residual approach as the third and final one. But take note that the residual approach is only permissible in certain limited circumstances. Also under step four, if there are cases of overall discount, so any overall discount compared to the aggregate of standalone selling prices will be allocated between performance obligations on a relative standalone selling price basis. Take note, however, that in certain circumstances, it may be appropriate to allocate such a discount to some but not all of the performance obligations within the contract. Also, in cases where consideration is paid in advance or in arrears, the entity will need to consider whether the contract includes a significant financing component or financing arrangement, and if so, the need to adjust for the time value of money. A practical approach that may be available where the interval between transfer of the promised goods or services and payment by the customer is expected to be less than 12 months so that is when you can also apply this approach and then let's move finally to step five in the revenue recognition framework so step five which says revenue should recognize when or as the entity satisfies each performance obligation we are saying that revenue here is recognized as control is passed either over time or at a point in time remember this it's very very important what happens when we talk about control we are saying that control of an asset is defined as the ability to direct the use of and obtain substantially all of the remaining benefits from the asset take note that this includes the ability to prevent others from directing the use of and obtaining the benefits from the asset also, the benefits related to the assets are the potential cash flows that may be obtained directly or indirectly. These include a number of things and that could be things such as using the asset to produce goods or provide services, using the asset to enhance the value of other assets, using the asset to settle liabilities or to reduce expenses, selling or exchanging the assets, pledging the asset to secure a loan, holding the assets, among several others. Here also, an entity is deemed to recognize revenue over time if a number of criteria is met. For example, the customer simultaneously receives and consumes all of the benefits provided by the entity as the entity performs the obligation. The next is the entity's performance creates or enhances an asset that the customer controls as the asset is created or the entity's performance does not create any asset with an alternative use to the entity and the entity has an enforceable right 
to payment for performance completed to date. Finally, if an entity does not satisfy its performance obligation over time, then it means it satisfies it at a point in time. In this case, revenue will be recognized when control is passed at a certain point in time. Let's now talk about a very important component of the standard IFRS 15, which is contract cost. So under contract cost, we are saying the incremental cost of obtaining a contract must be recognized as an asset if the entity expects to recover these costs. However, these incremental costs are limited to the cost that the entity would not have incurred if the contract had not been successfully obtained. An example of this would be success fees that are paid to agents. A practical approach is available that allows the incremental cost of obtaining a contract to be expensed if the associated amortization period will be 12 months or less. Also, cost in care to fulfill a contract are recognized as an asset if and only if all of the following criteria are met. The first criteria is that the cost relates directly to a contract or a specific anticipated contract. The next is that the cost generates or enhance resources of the entity that will be used in satisfying performance obligations in the future. And finally, the cost should be expected to be recovered. Some of these costs include costs such as direct labor, direct materials, and the allocation of overheads that relate directly to the contract. Finally, the asset that is recognized in respect of the cost to obtain or fulfill a contract is required to be amortized on a systematic basis that is consistent with the pattern of transfer of the goods or services to which the asset relates. Now let's talk about how these will be presented in the financial statement. So contract with customers will be presented in an entity statement of financial position or the balance sheet as a contract liability, a contract asset or a receivable depending on the relationship between the entity's performance and the customer's payment. First is that a contract liability is presented in the statement of financial position where a customer has paid an amount of consideration prior to or before an entity performs by transferring the related good or service to the customer. Then the next is that where the entity has performed by transferring a good or service to the customer and the customer has not yet paid the related consideration, then either a contract asset or a receivable is presented in the statement of financial position depending on the nature of the entity's rights to consideration. A contract asset is recognized when the entity's right to consideration is conditional on something other than the passage of time. For example, let's say future performance of the entity. A receivable, on the other hand, is recognized when the entity's right to consideration is unconditional except for the passage of time. Now, take note that contract assets and receivables are required to be accounted for in accordance with IFRS 9 financial instruments. And as such, any impairment relating to contract with customers should be measured, presented, and disclosed in accordance with IFRS 9 financial instruments. Finally, any difference between the initial recognition of a receivable and the corresponding amount of revenue recognized should also be presented as an expense, for example, as an impairment loss. So finally, IFRS 15, Revenue from Contract with Customers, has a number of disclosure requirements which have the objective of being that an entity is required to disclose sufficient information to enable users of financial statements to understand the nature, the amount, the timing, and the authenticity of revenue and cash flows arising from contract with customers. Because of this, an entity is required to disclose both qualitative and quantitative information about all revenue-related transactions. So this has been the summary of IFRS 15. If you love this video, don't forget to smash the like button and don't forget to share this video within your entire network. I'll catch you in the next summary video.